situation that we face can be dominated by our own inner convictions. We can solve any problem in one of several ways. Now here's another situation that arises. The individual wishing to solve a problem decides for himself how that solution must be attained. He knows what the solution is that he wants. But as Pythagoras says, every man knows what he wants, but only God knows what he needs. Therefore, in an effort to achieve a solution, we think in terms of comfort, release from responsibility, pleasure, or profit. Whereas nature is interested in achievement, in the strengthening of the internal resources of the person. Actually, if we look around ourselves, we will find that we live in a world in which certain dictatorial attitudes have become prevalent. Nations, leaders of all degrees and all, and all magnitudes are attempting to control each other. We wish to dominate a world politically, economically, scientifically, socially, uh, religiously. The difference between a great political movement and a great religious movement is only the particular fact or form of domination that each exercises. It is not our comfort or our happiness or our growth that is the final consideration. Somebody wants to govern other people, wants to control them, exploit them, use them, and if necessary, destroy them if they have refused to obey. This is an, a wrong attitude to begin with. And therefore, as long as nations or individuals dominate in this way, the tragedy will never end. It is not the domination of another, but the direction of ourselves that is the reason for evolution as far as man is concerned. So when you start in with this problem, you begin by assuming one point, which uh, we all have to have faith in something. Faith is the beginning of effort. Faith is that attitude in ourselves that is supported by the highest traditions of the race, the greatest experiences of the past, and those things held most sacred and dear to our own hearts and souls. Faith, therefore, must have a proper integration, a proper point of view. There are two forms of faith that are important to us. One is faith in universal integrity, and the other is faith in the possibility of personal self-unfoldment. If the individual believes that the universe is honest, then there is no longer any reason for his own dishonesty. If he believes that there is within himself a divine spark or a flame or a light then he has the faith to do something about it. So faith is the acceptance of an honorable hypothesis. Faith is something that must be accepted first and proven by experience later. If our faith is wrong to start with, we can be very embittered and may are likely to blame the religion we belong to or the world we live in. But faith is basically the individual's acceptance of a law of universal love and justice. With this in the back of the mind, he can also gain a great example from history. History is the proof of faith. It has been said that the Christian Bible is the basis of a great hope for mankind, of, and of mankind. And it is a book of faith strengthening. It doesn't tell you all the things you want to know. In fact, tells you very little. But it strengthens your realization or belief that there is a good, that there is a reason for self, that there is a destiny toward which we are all laboring with varying degrees of success. But faith begins in the term of mysticism by simple recognition that the individual can grow and can accomplish all good 
that is necessary to himself. Also, that this faith is best manifested through a complete pattern of unselfish dedication to principles. That the individual also, in the process of learning, must learn, as many have in the course of years, that the most important of all religious exercises is service. The individual who forgets himself comes nearer to his own soul. The individual who is always thinking of himself and his own rights, his own privileges, and his own uh, abilities is usually not internally enlightened. It is the forgetting of self in the fulfillment of the law that brings us closer and closer to inner potential. Actually, according to Emerson, and I think this is equally true of the other schools, Neoplatonism, as it is found in Athens, in Proclus, and in Alexandria through Plotinus, Iamblichus, and other great Neoplatonists, these teachers took a theology uh, that had descended to them from Plato principally, and they gradually adapted it uh, to a complete dedication to the highest possible concepts of human life. They were the ones who emphasized most of all uh, the tremendous importance of simple sincerity in the strengthening of the spiritual life. Most of these people were philosophers and had philosophical backgrounds, but philosophy is a very broad term. Philosophy does not necessarily mean one of the schools such as we know today. Most of these schools now are loggerheads with each other. It does not mean a sheer intellectualism in which we try to rationalize ourselves into a state of grace. Philosophy is nothing more or less than organized idealism. idealism. It is the individual uh, using the inner values of his own life to create what he calls common sense. Common sense is simply the most natural and most obviously correct way of directing a life. Common sense is the most uncommon of all sensory perceptions, but it arises when the individual begins to cast off superficial and for the most part impossible or irrational hypotheses and settles down to the common circumstances of life. Common sense has been likened to childhood because in the early years of life the individual has not been spoiled and what we call growing up is largely the destruction of our own inner lives. Not destruction in the sense of a final annihilation, but the prevention of these inner values from coming through. Children, and small children especially, are normally friendly, kindly, and affectionate. They are trusting. They believe in things. And it is only when they are gradually educated out of their own faith that we have more and more trouble with them. We have in the metaphysics, especially in mysticism, the quiet way, the way of peaceful growth through the acceptance of responsibility, through a quiet fulfillment of all duties, and for a complete control of our own attitudes. Mysticism, by quieting the inner life, by taking away from it all the pressures and inconsistencies and absurdities with which we burden it, allows the truth to come through. In other words, it is another statement of what it says in the Bible, Be still and know that I am God. If we are quiet enough in the outer life, the inner life comes through. We hear the voice of the silence. We hear the gradual revelation of the nobility within ourselves, not as words, but as very quiet values and strength, and an increasing courage to keep the rules. In the uh, transcendentalist system of thinking, the mystical experience, or the experience of man's relationship to deity, 
is not something that comes uh, as a reward for a specialized training. It is a reward simply for the life of virtue, what uh, Confucius calls the life of the superior person, the person who is so integrated in himself that he is incapable of being over-influenced uh, by the corruptions of his environment. The gentle person, completely relaxed, but not negative, is the one in whom the soul power or the inner life is the greatest possibility of manifesting itself. One thing, of course, that most people have gotten into trouble with is the conflict between the ego and the soul. The ego, or the I am, me and mine, does not represent the true self. It has been demonstrated in nearly all systems of learning, mysticism, psychology, and religion, that the ego is a false god. The ego is simply the superficial uh, summary of undigested experiences and unenlightened attitudes. The ego is a kind of self. It is the self that says, gimme, I want, I must have. The type of ego is that which tears down others to build up self. Ego has concern with riches, wealth, social standing, and very often with dissipation. The ego is a personal self allowed to dominate the impersonal self locked within it. The ego is the superficial outside of the human personality. It is that which most commonly dominates conduct and therefore most commonly mutilates conduct. The difference between the ego and the soul is that the ego lives in this world, thinks in terms of it, expects nothing beyond it, and wants to build into this material existence every satisfaction that is conceivable. There is no long-range plan, because to the ego there is no long-range. There is simply the immediate comfort, whether it be by dissipation or by damaging other people. Uh, the ego is the source of crime. It is the source of practically every delinquency of the individual. These delinquencies arising from various negative attitudes or from the simple desire to succeed without effort. The individual who does not want to earn what he has and tries to take it some other way is a victim of his own ego. Of a sudden, the fallacy of it all bursts upon him. He can no longer live with his own external. The internal, frustrated perhaps for many lives, is gradually demanding attention because the external becomes increasingly uncomfortable. After you abuse the body long enough, it fights back. If you abuse life long enough, it turns against you. And sometimes in an emergency of that type, there is an extension of consciousness. This is the way in which most mystics interpret the conversion of St. Paul, who suddenly reversed his position because something happened whereby he was able to dominate his own ego and to transmute himself into a servant rather than being a master over outer things. He became a servant of inner things. Now this sense of ego as uh, in conflict with the soul causes us again to ask a little bit more about the soul. Emerson and the Neoplatonists of Alexandria and Athens were of one mind on this particular uh, point. The soul is a transcendent being, and this transcendent being is the key to the transcendentalist concept of life. The soul is that seed of eternity which is sown in man at the time of his creation. It is the seed of the life that goes on from generation to generation. It is this seed which is transmitted from parent to child and from child to their child. All this is that life principle which is within the human being, which is not only a principle of vitality, 
but which has